How are you doing guys? Welcome to another video. This is topic 2.2, .2, explaining emission spectra. And this is probably a prac that you did in class. So we're going to talk about how we produce an emission spectra. We're going to look at the relationship between colour, frequency and energy. And then we need to distinguish between a line and a continuous spectrum. Let's go. Okay, topic 2.2, .2, explaining emission spectra, and we're going to build on some of the knowledge that you might have gained doing a flame test practical. The IB understandings is we need to know what an emission spectrum is and how it is produced, and then we need to have an understanding of hydrogen's emission spectrum. We need to be able to describe the relationship between wavelength, colour and frequency, and make the distinction between a continuous and line spectrum. Then we also need to know a little bit about how the hydrogen spectrum works. Okay, so here's an example of the electromagnetic wave, the electromagnetic spectrum. At one end, we have high energy. At the other end, we have low energy. And you can think of this as like a giant piano with hundreds of thousands of miles of keys between it, if every key represent at one wavelength. So we have high energy and we have low energy. Now something with a short wavelength, which is like peak to peak, that would have a very high energy. So something with a short wavelength has really high energy. Something with a long wavelength, like radio waves, that has a low energy. So we've got all of these different waves that have either high or low energy depending upon their wavelength. Now the frequency, the frequency is if you have a short wavelength, then you have a high frequency. The frequency is essentially how many waves pass through a point at a given time. If you have a low wavelength, then you're going to have a low frequency. Gamma rays, they're kind of the thing with the most highest energy in the spectrum. The visible light kind of sits in the middle. And then we have our radio waves, both AM and FM, that have the least amount of energy, a very low energy technique. We can also work out the frequency using a formula which is in the data book where C is the speed of light and it's multiplied by the free equals the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. So if you're given some of these values, you could work out the frequency, but I haven't seen that used as yet, but it is in the data book. Okay, so just like the prac, heating an element can cause an electron to absorb energy and jump to a higher excited energy level. That excited energy level is where the electron is unstable. So the electron might jump from the first shell to the fourth shell by gaining energy from the flame. It is now in an excited state. In that excited state, it's unstable and it doesn't want to exist in that state for a long period of time. Think of it like a ladder. The electron has just climbed the ladder, it's gone up the ladder, so it's now got more energy. Now the only way this unstable electron can get rid of the energy is in the form of light. And it can jump down its shells in a number of different ways. It might jump from the fourth shell to the third shell and release a smaller fixed amount of energy or it could jump from, say, the fourth shell back to the first shell, which would release more energy. But every time it jumps from one shell to the other, it releases a fixed amount of energy. So it depends on the number of different ways that this electron can return to its ground state, that, and that is what produces all of the colours. So a bigger jump would produce more of a violet or blue type colour. A smaller jump will produce more of a red. Once we get shells that are a long, long way away, we get very small energies which where our eyes might not even be able to see. So each shell corresponds to a different amount of energy released, and that starts to build up what we know as the emission spectrum. Now, in an emission spectrum, we're not removing the electron from the shells, but we can remove an electron from the shells if we give it enough heat. Generally, a Bunsen burner isn't enough heat to remove the electron, but an electron that is removed, that's called the ionization energy. And it's easier to remove outer shell electrons than it is electrons that are closer to the nucleus. So on this diagram down here, I've got an electron jumping from the first shell, the ground state, to the, four, to the, to the fourth shell, so the third excited state. Now that electron, it could jump right back to where it was originally, in the ground state. Now that is a long way away, that's a lot of energy. So any electron jumping back to the ground state or the first electron shell will probably be in the UV section of the electromagnetic spectrum and we won't be able to see it. 
An electron jumping from the third excited state down to the first excited state though, that is in the visible spectrum. And that's like a blue purple. It's still a large amount of energy, but it's enough energy that we can physically see it. If we've got an electron jumping from the third shell to the second shell, well that's a smaller amount of energy, and that might be like an orange. An electron jumping from the fourth shell to the third shell, that's an even smaller amount of energy, so that might be a red. The further and further the electrons go out, the, the energy between the shells gets smaller and smaller, so the energy released is smaller. Any electron that returns back to the first shell, the initial shell, that will be UV. Any electron that returns to the second shell will be a visible light spectrum. So when we place these ions in the flame, we see the color that is a combination of all of the different wavelengths of light that the electrons are emitting. So if we have a sample like copper chloride, we place that into the flame and we might have seen the blue green color. Now, if our eyes were sensitive enough, we could actually see all of the wavelengths of light that make up that color. But to do that, we use an instrument and we pass the light through a prism and we can see all of these discrete lines in the spectrum. All of these lines in the emission spectrum represent all of the different electrons jumping or re sorry, returning to their ground or excited states. And every time they return back, they're releasing a fixed amount of light. So we can see here the copper one is quite complex. It's got a wide variety of colors that make up that, that spectrum. But an emission spectrum is always colored lines on a black background. If we have a different element, like calcium, we can see that it will have a different emission spectrum. That's because all of the elements can be used as like a fingerprint. So if we have a calcium emission spectrum, we expect to see the same lines in the exact spots. So each of the elements will have its own unique spectrum. So this is the strontium one, we see it as red, but the combination of the different energies emitted gives it the red color. Okay, the hydrogen spectrum. Hydrogen was the easiest to observe because it only had one electron. So this all started with somebody observing hydrogen spectrum. Now, any electron in the hydrogen atom that returns to the first shell will be found in the ultraviolet region, which is known as the Lyman series. Those have the highest amount of energy because there's the biggest gap between the shells. Any electron returning to the second shell is, can be found in the visible region of the spectrum. That's known as the Barma series. And any electron that returns to the third electron shell is known as the Passion series, which is the infrared. Now on the diagram you can see if we're jumping the smallest amount of energy, that's going to be our red and the, the higher amounts of energy will they're more likely to be our blues. So the furthest distance from the shells will indicate either more or less energy. With the passion series we have the infrared which would have even less energy than the red area of the spectrum. Now what's happening in the hydrogen spectrum is known as convergence. So once we have electrons that are a long, long way away from the nucleus, the energies of these electrons begin to overlap. So if we had the inf infinite electron shell, the difference between that and infinity minus one would be very, very small. So we're starting to get energies that we just can't differentiate. And what happens is the energies become so close together that we can't tell them apart, and it looks like just a chunk of light at the end of the spectrum. Now convergent only occurs at the high energy end of the spectrum. And if you look at the hydrogen emission spectrum, you can see that as the lines got closer to the high energy end, they actually get closer together. On the iron spectrum, you can see some of these areas of convergence and they look just like a big chunk of color. So we need to make the distinction between a continuous and a line spectrum. Now the emission spectrum of hydrogen, it's relatively simple compared to the other elements because it only has one electron and it's broken down into three distinct colors. Each line represents radiation of a specific wavelength. So that is a line spectrum and it's really clear that we have a red, a sort of teal color and a blue color. Now remember that any electron returning to the first electron shell, that will be UV and any electron returning to the second electron shell will be our visible. So the smallest one going from the third shell to the second shell, that's probably our red, 
from like the fourth shell to the second shell, that's going to have more energy, so that's like that teal colour. And then from a shell further than that, returning to the second will give us our blue. The separate lines in a series, they become closer together as we get electrons that are jumping further and further away because the energy between the shells starts to decrease and this is where the energies start to overlap. So a line spectrum is where you can clearly see the difference between the energy levels. A continuous spectrum is where those lines get so close together that you're unable to differentiate and the radiation spreads across all frequencies of that particular part. Okay, topic two, some top tips. Know the difference between a continuous line spectrum. It's a very common exam question. And remember that the energies only converge at the higher frequencies or the higher energies. So thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.